Good to have you with us on the Richard and Judy Book Club podcast, exclusive to WH Smith. Let me introduce you to the latest member of our club. Shh. It's time to find out about the quality of silence. My name is Rosamond Lupton and I wrote The Quality of Silence. I sleep with a notepad next to my bed. I've now got one from America where you pull the pen out and the pad lights up so you can write down whatever pressing thought you have in the middle of the night that you can't remember in the morning. So I do that and I'm completely immersed. I don't go anywhere without my notebook. I write differently depending on what stage of the novel I'm at. So at the beginning, when I'm just thinking of ideas and imagery, I like to be outside or in a cafe. I remember watching people sailing on, on a windy loch in Scotland and writing about how Ruby saw the world and music. And then it gets to the really hard part where I have to structure it. And that means long hours at a desk in silence with lots of note notelets everywhere and loads of computer files open at the same time. And then it's really the length of time I spend writing is how long the novel is. So the longer it is, the longer I'm spending at my desk. I find when I finish the novel, I can't let it go. I'm, I'm really, I'm very bad at that pens down moment, especially with this novel because it has so many different facets um, and interesting things would crop up and I'd want to put them in. And I had to, at one point, go, right, it's at the printers now. There's nothing more I can do. So why did we choose The Quality of Silence for our 2016 spring collection? Ooh, I'd say three reasons. One, it's just a rattling good yarn in itself. It's a really, really quickly moving, fast-paced adventure story, really. Two, because of the backdrop of Alaska and Alaska at dead of winter, which I hadn't really realised. Once you go north beyond a certain point, really into the Arctic Circle, it's totally dark. It's completely black. Um, the sun never makes an appearance for about uh, nine, ten weeks. And right in the middle of that period, you don't even get that lightning of the sky below the, the horizon line where the sun is just sort of lurking. It's completely dark. And so as she writes, on a, on a, on a cloudy night, or if it's snowing at night, there's no moonshine, there's no starlight, uh, there are no buildings because they're in the middle of nowhere. And these characters are moving through this pitch black, freezing cold environment. And she writes it beautifully, electrifyingly. I mean, you, you, you could be there. Um, and I suppose thirdly, because it's about a man who has apparently been killed in desperately sad circumstances, but whose wife refuses to believe that he's a goner. Um, and there she is with her little, little girl, 10 years old, who's completely deaf, profoundly deaf, questing alone like a sort of an arrow through the dark to try and find her missing husband and her daughter's missing father. And it's just, a page turner doesn't cover it. Yeah, it's a really, really sophisticated thriller and the Alaskan atmosphere and the snow, mm. the freezing temperatures, the black nights, mm. uh, are, are amazingly menacing. It's, it's a beautiful book. Leaving Berlin by Joseph Cannon. An interesting book because it is very dark and very subtle and foreboding in places but it grasps you and you want to know what's going to happen next. Spool of Blue Thread. I'm really enjoying the book, I'm enjoying all the characters. I like the twists and turns, I like the secrets. They appear just like a normal family, uh, appear all to be hugely dysfunctional characters. It's not high drama, but you actually do get really involved with the people and you want certain things to happen to them. She shone the torch at the wheels, as she'd feared ice was wedged into them. She hit the ice with the hammer, but it was hard as metal and wouldn't give way. She tried again and again. Each time it was harder to hold the hammer. She thought about the coastal bus journey to Cly that she and Matt had gone on so many times years ago. First stop, home next to the sea, then Thornham, Titchwell, Brankster, Brankster, Staith. Each time she hit the ice, she thought of the next seaside stop. Burnham Deepdale, Burnham Market, Burnham Overy, Hocum, Wells, Cly. When she hit at the ice for the 20th time, she could no longer remember which seaside village came next, or even their names, and she couldn't keep hold of the hammer. Loss of memory and poor grip were early signs of hypothermia. She had to get back into the truck. She shone her torch away from the wheels, and into the darkness. Sky, land and snow had fused together into one alien, infinite totality. She thought that this was what grief was like. This was her mind when her mother had died. The endless bleak aloneness of it. Somewhere out there was Matt. 
She yelled his name into the dark as loudly as she could, but although her mouth formed the shapes to make the sound and her lungs formed his name into a scream, the sound was obliterated by the wind so that she didn't know if she'd made any sound at all. It was as if she'd created a void around herself and she could no longer be sure of her presence in this place. She climbed the steps back towards the cab, the wind trying to tear her away, her feet numb. I'm delighted to say that the next novel on the Richard and Judy Book Club spring list is The Quality of Silence by Rosamond Lupton. Not only am I delighted to say that because it's a fantastic book, but because we also had Rosamond and her debut novel, which was Sister, which went on to become a massive bestseller. And uh, The Quality of Silence is, is just absolutely worthy of that. Nice to see you, Rosamond. Lovely to see you again. Nice to see you again. Now, First of all, just tell us a, a brief outline of the book, what actually happens and, and, and why. It's, it's about a woman called Yasmin and her daughter Ruby arriving in Alaska, expecting Matt, the dad, to meet them at the airport. He's been working as a wildlife photographer. Mm. Instead, there's a police officer. Yeah. Yasmin's told that her husband is dead, that there's been a terrible fire in this village up in the north. And Yasmin just refuses to believe it. And feeling she's got no other option, she sets off across yeah. northern Alaska in winter, taking Ruby and they're driving into a polar night, so there will be no morning coming, the temperature's dropping. Alaska, yeah. the whole environment that you describe throughout the book so vividly is a character in its own right. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's if you like, the fourth or the fifth character in the book, if, if not the third. Tell us about that, because it, uh, you must have been there, I because been the way there. you describe it is extraordinary. This I have, blackness uh, in I winter. I think darkness is really extraordinary, and in fact, I was just listening to a radio programme about every cell in our bodies is calibrated to a clock, to a, a diurnal clock with light, and if you don't have really? that, mm. yeah. Uh, it's quite new research and it's, it's fascinating. I mean, even algae apparently have something in their DNA that means so that So what happens to humans uh, north, exactly. north of the Arctic Circle? Well, I wonder about Inupiat people. I think that they have adapted to life in this constant darkness and then light in the summer where there's a midnight sun. And interestingly, when missionaries came over, they converted them to Christianity, but couldn't get people to have regular meal times and <laughs> bedtimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, where I think us Westerners going over there is profoundly disorientating. Yes. Because what, just, just to sort of explain it, what it is, the, the sun simply doesn't appear above the horizon. Doesn't. Because From November to January. Yeah. Um, and if it's cloudy at night, mm. um, you don't even get that faint glow below the horizon. No, exactly. Or starlight or moonlight. Nothing. So a cloudy night in, say, uh, late November, mid-December in, in Alaska is black. It's there black. is You can't see a thing. No, and there's no houses on the horizon or towns or villages. Because no. for hundreds of miles there's nothing. No. So wow. I, I was very interested in that darkness and setting yeah. a novel. And, and yeah, and, and, be, and you know, it, the, your book is a thriller. It's a, it's a very sophisticated thriller with a lot of aspects to it. Um, but then that, that dark, that black atmosphere mm -hmm. and the incredible freezing temperatures and the snow uh, makes it for a fantastic um, background, a atmosphere thing. The other, he, the, Richard said, uh, um, Alaska is sort of a character in its own right. But the main character for me uh, is Yasmin, obviously, and her daughter, Ruby. Now, uh, Ruby's 10 and she thinks she's going to see her dad with her mum for Christmas, um, and uh, she is profoundly deaf. Now, I'd forgotten, but I should have known, I should have remembered, because I remember you mentioning this when we interviewed you about sister, but um, you yourself have experience of, of some deafness. Yes, as a child I, I went really quite deaf um, without realising, or no one around me realised it, I was sent to the back of the class for inattention, <laughs> my behaviour apparently wasn't good enough, my work declined. Classic. And nobody realised, and I went to see a specialist, um, finding a lot of earache, and he said, ice cream, and I went, ice cream, and then he put a book up in front of his mouth, and I had no idea that he'd said anything at all. Mm. So oh. they realised that I'd become really very deaf, and hearing was restored in one ear, but not the other, so I'm still deaf in my What was the reason idea. for that deafness? It was a very rare... Um, disease. Okay. I was the youngest person to have it. But you've got hearing in one ear now? I have hearing in one ear. So obviously then you can write with real insight into what it's like to be a child and have profound hearing issues and, and I, I, with, along with Judy, actually Ruby was my favourite character. I thought she was amazing. She's such a plucky little girl, so brave. But she doesn't like to speak. Her mother wants her to speak. Yes, that's right. Her mother wants her to use her mouth to speak because yes. she's frightened she'll be isolated if she doesn't. But I was imagining what it would be like now to be a child who's profoundly deaf. And we write to each other all the time. You know, we text, text we tweet, email. we blog. Yes, and so she's got this written voice, which yeah. wouldn't have been available when, when I was a child. And that's how she communicates. And in, in that language, she can hear herself, if you like. Yeah. So she's an equal participate, participant in the conversation. And she's as loud and as fluent as her hearing friend. And because she's so expert at, at lip reading, 
um, she can sometimes pick things up yes. that somebody else wouldn't. I mean, a whispered conversation in the corner of the room, she can hear it, as it were, because she can lip yes, read. Yes, exactly. I mean, the FBI actually employ um, deaf people who are lip readers. Really? Put them on stakeouts so that they can lip read. Really? Yeah, I didn't they know do. That. Yes. Yeah. Of course, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, social media now must mean that the world is revolutionised yes. for deaf children. Uh, children especially, because they kind of um, adapt so much more quickly to it now. I think you said, you say, and we asked you about the the deafness thing in, at the back of the book and you say that um, it's a first language for them now yeah. and they are incredibly fluent. Yeah, it's their mother tongue, they don't think about it. We have to try and become fluent but for mm. them it's, it's something different. Right. So mother and daughter set off on this epic journey, um, like an arrow into the dark. Yeah. They, leave the, they leave all civilization behind and they're plunging due north, crossing the Arctic Circle in pitch blackness day and night. Um, and you've introduced this fantastic, I don't want to give too much of the plot away, although it's, it's, so, it's so tempting when you're with the author, you, you want to talk about the end <laughs> and everything. Um, but you introduce this real tension, they're being followed in the darkness. Yes. Someone is, is shadowing them all the time. I thought it was interesting um, how she would perceive that, and it's something about the dark, we don't know what we can't really see in the dark, if it's a goodie or a baddie, we don't know if it's a no. threat. Or, yeah. And so to start with, she, she chooses to see these blue headlights behind her as their protector. And yeah. then she realises that it's more of a predator in the yeah. darkness. Yeah. I mean, I was actually driving to London when I first had the idea for this and someone was just too close behind me down the M3 in the dark. And I thought, well, this is really creepy. Uh. That, was, that, was the, that was the starting point yeah, for the story. Yeah, it was. Right? And, and when did it occur to you to set it in Alaska? Well, it all just came together. I, it was all, I've been it's interested funny, in Alaska, it? I've been interested yeah. in deafness, and suddenly I thought, right, it's a mother and daughter driving across Alaska, headlights behind them. Yeah. How long does it take you to, from that, that, that light bulb moment, driving down the M3, to writing the end? It took a long time. I mean, it must have taken over two years, partly because mm. there was a lot of research. I, you know, there was Inupiat yeah. people, there was fracking, there's wildlife in Alaska, yeah. all sorts of things that I wanted to get right. You know, I don't know about deaf young people now, no. yeah. so I wanted to make sure that that side of the story. And the, 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 their central mission, of course, is to find Matt, Yasmin's yes. husband, also, it, the book very, very um, is very much centred around sort of, if you like, that this amazing pure beauty of yes. Alaska, which is being gradually eroded, and it's very, very anti-fracking. Yes, it is. Um, which is part of the plot. Um, does that mean you are? I am. I mean, I, I started thinking about this plot a long time ago when no one knew in England what fracking was, but I knew a very eminent hydrologist. And I said, is this story credible? And he went, yeah, how many ways do you want that to happen? Mm. You know, that, and that was quite a terrifying moment. I mean, yeah. I had a story, but I... So what do you think then about this recent uh, decision in Parliament, by a majority, uh, to allow fracking under the national parks? I in think the UK? people don't know enough about fracking. I think if they looked at America and looked at what happened there, then at the very least we'd have a moratorium like Germany, like New York State. You know, there are countries who have seen the risks and don't want it. And, I think and as a writer, um, obviously this is a novel, this is a made-up story, this is Let's Pretend, but the fracking element is, is, a, is a very factual part of it, and politically factual. Did you feel a sense of um, almost entitlement of being able to put your point of view across through a novel? N no, I think what I did, first of all, fracking, when I wrote the book, there was no fracking in Alaska. It seemed to me the last place they would do it, this white, unspoiled wilderness. Yeah. Right. And actually now it's, it's going ahead. Really? Um, I knew that a company had bought leases, but that's all I knew, so it's going ahead. I think I just wanted an image rather than to write pages and pages. Mm. I just wanted a really striking set of images and an image mm. about it. Well, it's a lovely book, wonderful book. Uh, you've done it again, as they <laughs> Thank say. Thank you very much. Um, it's had fantastic reviews as well, not just from us, but uh, from, from, from all sorts of people and, and publications. And Rosamond, thank you very much indeed. And w are you working on your next one now? I'm at the lovely stage with lots of ideas and characters, and I'm just in that thinking time. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. you don't like deadlines, do you? I don't. No. <laughs> Whereas you say, I can't write without one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I need that kosh over my head. Well, look, The Quality of Silence is obviously available wherever you look in terms of bookshops and online and, and you name it. But if you do get your copy from W.H. Smith, you get a bit more for your money. Uh, because in the back of the book, we have all the extra content that comes with the Richard and Judy Book Club. There's, there's special pieces written by Rosmond about the process of writing it. There's a question and answer session from Judy and I asking some rather different questions than we've asked here, I hope. Um, so you do actually get much more of an insight into uh, how the story was written, uh, what it means, and uh, how Rosmond ticks, really. But hopefully you got a bit of an impression of that here today. Rosmond, thank you. Thank you. Richard and Judy, taking the hard work out of a difficult decision. 
Take their recommendations and you're guaranteed a great read. Exclusive to WH Smith. So I always knew I wanted it to be somewhere quite remote, quite cut off from civilization. And initially, the house I imagined was quite old, it was quite tumble down. And actually, as I wrote it, I realized that wasn't the effect that I wanted at all. So I rethought the house completely and it became this kind of incongruous glass edifice in the middle of a forest. I think it partly came from watching too many episodes of Grand Designs. We're heading to a dark place in a dark, dark wood. It's by Ruth Ware and she joins us next time on the Richard and Judy Book Club podcast exclusive to WH Smith. <laughs>